praise him like he's a mighty God. Yes. A mighty God deserves a mighty yes. praise.
that we are here. Let us continue to worship him. We worship a mighty God. When we came in this morning, it was cloudy, but look, look now. Nothing but a mighty God in a matter of minutes can turn it from a cloud to a, from a cloudy day to a sunshiny day. Nothing but a mighty God. And that God deserves all of our worship. And that God deserves all of our praise. Let's praise him this morning. Let's worship him this morning. Let's magnify him. Let's edify him. Let's lift his name. Amen. Amen. We will proceed with the further part of our worship experience. Amen. 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 Amen.
have a problem having examinations most times. I, I don't know what we're afraid of, but we don't want to have examinations. So we need to do this for bed deaths. Do we have any visitors this morning? Sit on the front row here. Yeah. 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 
He played in the band all through high school and went. When he graduated from high school, he went to college. And guess what his major was? Music. <laughs> yes. And after graduating from college, guess what kind of teacher he became? A music teacher. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I wonder how differently his life might have been or have turned out if he had asked his parents for that instrument only one time. What do you think if he only asked for it one time, didn't ask it anymore? What do you think would have happened? Well, he could have asked for it but he doesn't have to see it. Yeah, but, or he could have dated him. They may not have thought he was serious. They said, here you go again. Last week he wanted to play the drum. <laughs> this week he wanted to be in the football team. <laughs> this week, you know, he wanted to be in the debate club. So, you know, they might have said, mm, his mind, that he didn't really want to do that, so they didn't. But what was he, that word you just told he was persistent. Okay. So the Bible teaches us that just as our parents want what is best for us and will give us what we ask for, God our Heavenly Father also hears when we ask or we request for him. Sometimes we ask God for something one time and never mention it again. Maybe that is our impatience. When we ask for something, we want God to say yes, right? Want your parents to say yes? I know that is God for something I want to say yes. And we want him to say it now. Not later, but right now. But God is wise, isn't he? He's very wise. You see, God can look on the intentions of our heart. And God, can, God will know whether or not we're serious about what we're asking. God will also know whether or not what we're asking for is his. So do you think just because I ask God and, and I want my answer right now, I'm going to get everything I ask for? Yeah. What did you say? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you get everything you ask for? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> that, and God, remember, is a father. He's a father of those who belong to him. So no, but he loves us and he wants what is best for us. And he will answer yes. <laughs> if it's the right answer, okay? If it's something that he can give us, just like our parents, that won't harm us or separate us from, separate us from him, or is in his timing, then he will bless us. So, bow your little heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are like these children. Sometimes we ask for things we don't need that are not best. But Lord, help us to remember to be persistent when we desire something, we ask for your will and be persistent in our asking. Because you want us to come to you, even though we know what is in our hearts, you want us to come to a loving Father and ask and not give up. You said we should always ask, we should always see that we may find, we should always know. And so help us, Lord, just because we may not receive an answer today, but help us to be persistent and continue to believe that you are our Father, that you hear us, and that you will give us this. Help us not be weary, help us not faint, and believe that you don't hear us, God, because you do hear us. You do hear us. You hear your children. And so we thank you. We have a Father we can trust who hears us. And not only do you hear us, but you will have us. In Jesus' holy name, we pray, and we love you, Lord. We thank you for these children who are heritage, and we bless, we pray that you will bless them as they go out, and wherever they put their little hearts, wherever they put their little hands, and guide their minds, yes. and they may operate in truth and in wisdom yes. in a world that is lost. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' Amen. name, I pray. Amen. Amen. For today is Luke 10 30 through 37. I'm reading in the King James Version. And it reads as follows Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him, and departed, leaving him half dead. 
Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his animal's back, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarius, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? Then he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Amen. 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 God is blessed. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God has granted us this privilege and this opportunity to be back in his house one more time. Amen. There is so much going on in our world. <clears throat> to, I declare each day we live, I'm more thankful for that day. Amen. Amen. As I get older, I realize and understand that it was God's grace. Amen. And that we should cherish each and every moment that we have. Because life is here today and it's gone today. Amen. Amen. Dear friend of ours, Matthew, brother Matthew here, we grew up with this friend in the same church there, Greta Galilee. Uh, she was two days older than I am. God called her home. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. Amen. So, as I have said so often, death does not discriminate. <laughs> Uh, death has never been taken to court for discrimination. Amen. Amen. Uh, death calls the young and he calls the old. He calls the rich and he calls the poor. He calls the saved and he calls the lost. He calls the black, the white, the red, the yellow, whatever you are, God, death is coming to get you. And there is nothing you can do about it but to be ready. Amen. So let us, let us be ready. Amen. Let us live right yes. so we can die right. Amen. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 33. When you're found it, you may stand in reverence to the reading of his word. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 33, a very familiar passage of scripture. And it reads, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. You may be seated. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. I want to use for a thought this morning, don't look down on a man. Don't look down on a man. The Jackson Southern Eggs Quartet from Jackson, Mississippi, recorded a song in 1981 entitled, Don't Look Down on a Man with these lyrics. Some people laugh. Like at other people because they don't have food to eat. Some people find it funny because others don't have no shoes on their feet. Things may be good for you today and tomorrow. Things could be so rough. The only time you should look down on a man is when you're picking him up. Some people laugh at other people because the home they lead is so small. Some people find it funny because some don't have no home at all. Things may be good for you today, but tomorrow things could be so rough. The only time that you should look down on a man is when you're picking him up. You may be up today, and again, you may be down tomorrow. One day your life may be filled with happiness, and the next day with so much sorrow. But you should go to the middle. And take a good look at yourself. Then you will see that you are no better than nobody else. Don't look down on a man. Don't look down on a man. Unless you are picking him up. The Jackson Southern Nails felt the need to let the world know the importance of care, concern, and compassion. As I look at our society, these three are lacking. We're living in a society that has adopted a me, myself, and I philosophy. We're living where there's a lookout for number one theme of the day. 
We're living in a society where people would rather kick you than help you, beat you than bless you, curse you than care for you. The Southerners believe the only time that you should be looking down on a man is when you're picking him up. Uh, this would be a better world if more people adopted this statement, especially God's people. <laughs> I understand times are tough and there are some schemers, some shysters, and I and some ghettos out there. I understand there are those looking to set you up and beat you up. But I also know that, that more times than not, there are people in our circles, people in our churches, people in our families, people in our neighborhoods, and on our jobs who are down, but we don't pick them up. Now, I acknowledge there's the needy and the greedy, and sometimes it's difficult to tell them apart. But if you want someone to pick you up when you are down, then you need to consider helping while you can. Yeah. Uh, this nation would rather waste and help those who are less fortunate. They would rather step on you than give you a step up. There are even those who base their help on what color you are. Well, what if God had felt this way when he gave his only begotten son? Yeah. What if his son had felt that way when he went to Calvary? Yeah. Don't look down on a man. It's, a, it's appalling to know that we as the United States of America is the most progressive and one of the richest, if not the richest country in the world. And we would rather walk over, walk on and walk, and walk around those who are less fortunate. Uh, we would rather make fun of their condition and try to figure out how to humiliate them even more. This country believes in the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, but it's critical that we recognize that everybody doesn't have. It's important to know that everybody is somebody in God's eyes. It's important to note that we may not always be on top. Yeah. May not always have while, but while on top and while we have, lend somebody a helping hand. Yeah. Give an encouraging word. If you can't help, find somebody who can help. Yeah. Don't look down on a man. For in our text, Jesus is approached by a lawyer, uh, by a teacher, by a doctor of the law. He was trying to trap Jesus. He wanted to see how much Jesus knew. He was also trying to flatter Jesus, for he refers to him as master, which meant teacher. The lawyer wants to know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, that's a good question from the standpoint that we want to know about eternal life, but there's not enough that we can do to inherit eternal life. <laughs> For there is no work involved in gaining eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, for by grace are you saved. Through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Uh, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus unto Good works, uh, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, this isn't to minimize the significance of works, but how much work you do doesn't determine your entrance into heaven. Uh, I don't care how well you sing, how well you preach, how well you teach, how many people you have can help if you don't have the love of Jesus in your life. Yeah. Heaven will not be your home. Uh, 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 if, if that was the case, if works would have gotten us into heaven, then the thief on the cross wouldn't have made it. <laughs> Amen. He, he would not have made it. So Jesus then questions the lawyer, what does the law say? Uh, Jesus said, okay, I, I, I want to know what the law says. What, what you tell me, lawyer, what does the law say? You're a lawyer, you tell me, what does it say? Uh, Jesus wants to know what the lawyer knows. Yeah. So the lawyer replies by quoting Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God uh -huh. with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Yeah. 
This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For all these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Uh -huh. Jesus tells them, uh, he, he tells him, you're right. Uh, if you do this, eternal life is yours. Uh, but this isn't good enough for the lawyer. Uh, he, he proceeds to ask another question. Who is my neighbor? Uh, the, the question implies that he has no objective way to determine whom he should be loving. His assumption is that some people don't qualify to be his neighbor and are therefore undeserving of his love. So he wants to know how Jesus defines a neighbor. Uh, I, I'm wondering, I began to wonder how skilled, how knowledgeable is this person in the law? Uh, it seems he wants Jesus to do all of his work. Uh, uh, he, 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 I, I, I understand wanting to be sure but what and where has he been studying? Uh, how did he get his law degree? I recognize that no one knows it all, but anybody that is trying to test or trap Jesus must think he knows it all. Uh, I give him credit in that, I give the lawyer credit in that he wants to be sure. For this Christian journey is life or death. It's eternal life or eternal damnation. Yeah. So it behooves us if there's never one, if there's no other thing to be sure about in your life, you need to be sure about whether you're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. Yeah. Uh, but so, so, uh, so Jesus doesn't get an attitude with the man. Uh, he, he, he doesn't belittle him. He doesn't question him about his educational background. Jesus doesn't give him a master's thesis or a nor does he give him a doctoral dissertation. He proceeds to teach the lawyer with a pound. Yeah. Uh, he proceeds to illustrate his point with an earthly story which has a heavenly meaning. He wants to tell the story using something the lawyer can identify with. Jesus then illustrates what a neighbor is. Uh -huh. He begins by saying a certain man. Uh, there is no name. There is no race. There is no ethnicity, no religious denomination, no educational background given of this man. He says a certain man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, this distance was about 17 miles that involved a 3,000 foot drop in elevation. It's not recorded or known why the man was going down. There are commentators who describe the man as being foolish and irresponsible because he traveled a road that was considered dangerous because of its terrain, which was rocky and rugged, and because thieves were known to travel the road. <laughs> Uh, the road afforded the thieves the opportunity to begin to be in hiding. With this road being dangerous, why wasn't the man traveling with someone else? Uh, some might say the man was asking for trouble. <laughs> but as he was traveling, robbers beat him up and left him half dead. They did a number on this man. <laughs> He stripped him of his clothes and wounded him. Yeah. There was the man lying on the road with all his possessions gone. There are those who feel like he got what was coming to him. Considering the known reputation of this stretch of road, he was done in and now he needed help or he was going to die. Yeah. On the surface, it looks like help is on the way in the form of of a priest. Uh, not only was he going to get some physical help, but he was going to be encouraged and confident about what had happened to him. With this being such a notorious stretch of road, one would think the police would have been heavy in the area and possibly the first on the scene. But it was the priest. <laughs> 
It was the preacher. It was the one who was responsible for interpreting the law and officiating in the temple. Uh -huh. For the priest saw the man and walked by on the other side. Uh, maybe the priest didn't want to get involved. Maybe he knew the reputation of the road. He was probably in a hurry to get to his, he was probably in a hurry to get to his religious job, to get to his job, to get to where he could be seen and be heard. Uh, uh, he didn't even move to help the man. Uh, uh, he went by on the other side. Uh, this trip was a day's journey. And this priest would have had to risk something to get there. Uh, there was also a religious rule that a that a person that made a person unclean for seven days after touching a dead body. But had he gotten closer, he would have discovered the man wasn't dead. He was half dead. The law says. Uh, not touching a dead body. It didn't say anything about a half dead body. Uh, so he didn't get close enough to see that the man was half dead. For this ceremonial ritual caused the priest to lose his turn at the temple. He wasn't about to sacrifice his primary work and privilege for the man. His, prior his priority was out of order. He had put his job and his title before helping this man. Yes, yes. How many allow their position and their power uh -huh. to cause them to pass by on the other side? Yes. Uh, who needed him more, the people at the temple or the man on the road? Uh -huh. uh, Matthew 25, 41 through 46 says, Then Jesus talking, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me. You cursed in the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, and you clothed me, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungry? or thirst or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto me. Then Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, yes. you did it not to me. Yeah. And these shall go away in the everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Yeah. For God is looking for people who take time and not take a time. Yes, yes. Let me say that again. God is looking for people who take time and not take a time. Yes. Every now and then, Christianity inconveniences and interrupts. Mm -hmm. A blessing could be lost because you don't want to be interrupted. Yes. You don't want to be inconvenienced or you choose to be uninvolved. Yes. Uh, so the priest came by and did nothing. Yes. Now here comes another religious person. Here comes the Levite. The Levite was a temple worker who placed his safety before compassion. He may have felt the robbers could still have been in the area and even hiding at the scene. Maybe he didn't have his gun with him. Maybe he felt like someone else could help him. Perhaps he thought he he perhaps he thought he might have been the next victim. Again, it looks like he doesn't want any inconvenience, any interruption, or any involvement. The Levite did more than the priest. He did get close enough to look on him, but he still went by on the other side. A merciful, compassionate, and godly man would have saved the life regardless of pollution, knowing that provision was made for him to become clean again. Yes. For Jesus showed the superiority of the gospel over the law, teaching us to reject any religion or any law that would neglect a deed of mercy. Uh -huh. So, after the priest and the Levite, 
had come by and passed by on the other side. Here comes a Samaritan. Here comes the one the Jews hated. Uh, there are two things that cause this hatred of the Jews with the Samaritans. One was the Samaritans were mongrel or half Jews. A mixed breed by birth. About 720 BC, the king of Assyria had captured the ten tribes of Israel and deported many the, the many of the peoples scattered throughout Media. He then took people from all over the Assyrian Empire and transplanted them into Samaria to repopulate the land. Then a marriage took place and the people became a mixed breed. This infuriated the strict Jews who held to a pure race. Uh, the second reason for the hatred was the Samaritan were a mixed breed by religion as well as by birth. Uh -huh. The transplanted heathens, of course, brought their gods with them. Yeah. Uh -huh. For the God of Israel eventually won out, but the religion of the Samaritans never became pure Judaism. Yeah. For three things happened to cause this. And one was when Ezra led the Jews back from exile in Babylon, they started rebuilding the temple. Uh -huh. Well, the Samaritans offered their help, but were rejected by the Jews. This was so because the intermarriage and worship of false god. This forfeited their right to worship the one true God. This didn't sit well with the Samaritans. So the Samaritans said, well, y'all won't let us help rebuild the temple. Y'all won't let us in the temple. We'll just build our own temple. <laughs> uh, we'll build our own temple in Mount Gerasim as competition with the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. For the Samaritans twisted both the scripture uh, and the history to favor their own people and their nation. Mm -hmm. They did this by accepting only the first five books of the Bible <laughs> known as the Pentateuch. So they realized, they recognized only Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They claimed that the three great events that took place on Mount Garrison, e events that set it apart as a place of worship. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was here, it was at the place where Abraham offered Isaac. Mm -hmm. They were saying that this didn't happen on, at Mount Moriah, this happened at Mount Garrison where Metezedek met Abraham and where Moses built his first altar after leading Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, so the Samaritan, it was the Samaritan, the despised one, uh -huh. the Samaritan, the hated one, the Samaritan, the least valued one. Uh -huh. It was the Samaritan who ended up helping the man. Yeah. Uh, the most despised one was the one who made the difference. Uh -huh. He placed compassion. He placed care and concern before everything. Uh -huh. He placed it before prejudice. Uh -huh. He placed it before racism, uh -huh. opinion, work, time, energy, and money. Uh -huh. For the Good Samaritan taught and showed us who our neighbor is. Uh -huh. He gave his heart. He gave his compassion and his all to help the man. Yeah. He was unselfish and unassuming in his help. Yeah. He was traveling the same road. Yeah. He saw the same man uh -huh. and he moved to help him. Mm -hmm. He took no thought about his safety. It didn't matter to him that the man was a Jew. Uh -huh. He just knew someone needed some help. Yeah, yeah. So in verse 34, we read, and he went to him, uh -huh. and he bound up his wounds. Mm -hmm. He poured in some oil and some wine, uh -huh. and he set him on his own beast yeah. and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Yeah. The verse displays how we are to love our neighbor. Yeah. When he went to he went to him is indicative of going forth and reaching out personally to help someone. Mm -hmm. He bound up his wounds is indicative of easing the pain. Yeah. He poured oil and wine in 
to his wounds is indicative of giving his own goods. Yeah. Uh, he, he gave up his own goods to help somebody else. Yeah. He set him on his own beast is indicative of him sacrificing his own comfort. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't make the wounded man walk. He was the one walking in. He put the wounded man on his beast. Yeah. He brought him to an end. Yeah. It's indicative of providing the man's necessities. Yeah. He took care of him. It's indicative of the man being nursed and looked after the man personally. Yeah. For the Samaritan put love into action. Yeah. He just didn't say, I love you, man, and I hope somebody come and help you. Yeah. He put love into action. He gave of himself. He gave of his time. He gave his energy and his money. This is why I say every now and then Christianity will inconvenience you. It will interrupt your plans. Uh, but you still must be involved. For Christianity is not a religion for the convenient. Uh, it is. It's not a. It, it's a religion. Every now and then, that's going to cause some interruptions. Yes. But some good things can come out of some interruptions. Yes. For he was committed to doing the right thing. Yes. He didn't allow the history of the Jews and Samaritans to get in the way. Yes. For the next morning, uh, the next morning he gave the innkeeper. 34 cents, which was equal to two days of wages. Yeah. He assured the keeper that if he he would give him some more when he come back through, if that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So the innkeeper had to trust this man's word in order for him to tell the man, I need more right now. Right. Uh, but he wanted to do the right thing by the man yeah. and the innkeeper. Uh, the Samaritan saw a need and he met the need. Yeah. He didn't allow the environment to deter him. Yeah. He wasn't after fame and he wasn't after fortune. <clears throat> he was out to make things better for the man. Yeah. Yeah. Then Jesus posed another question to the Lord. Yeah. Who do you think yeah. was the real neighbor? Yeah. <clears throat> the lawyer's answer was the one who helped. Yeah. It was the one who showed compassion. Oh, yeah. It wasn't the one who had the title. It wasn't the one who was looking for fame and yeah. fortune. Yeah. So now the lawyer had answered. And Jesus wanted the lawyer to do the same thing. Yeah. If he saw somebody was in need for Jesus, it mattered not what the gender was. Mm -hmm. Matter not what the educational status was. Yeah. Matter not what neighborhood he lived in. Yeah. What church he went to. Yeah. Jesus wanted people to be helped when in tough times. Yeah. So don't look down on the man. Yeah. As we continue to walk this journey daily, yeah. we need to adopt. Don't look down on the man. Yeah. It's time for Christians to get down to the business yeah. of showing compassion, care, concern, and mercy. Yeah. It's time to put aside the differences. Yeah. It's time to show value to everybody. Yeah. For everybody is somebody. Yeah. And God is all. Yeah. There's a story entitled Mother Teresa's Feet, which illustrates the concept of being a neighbor. Yeah. For Shane Claiborne, who spent a summer in the slums of Calcutta, India, when Mother Teresa wrote the following about one of his experiences. People often ask me what Mother Teresa was like. Did she glow in the dark or have a halo? She was short, wrinkled, and precious. Maybe even a little ornery like a beautiful, wise old granny. But there is one thing I will never forget. Her feet were deformed. Each morning during mass, I would stare at those feet. I wondered if Mother Teresa had leprosy, but I wasn't going to ask, of course. So one day the sister asked her, have you noticed Mother's feet? We nodded curious. She said where her feet are deformed because we get just enough donated shoes for everyone. 
And mother does not want anyone to get stuck with the worst path. So she digs through and finds the worst path. Years of wearing bad shoes have deformed her feet. For this is the kind of love that places our neighbor's needs above our own. But the illustration doesn't stop there. There's a story entitled A Step-In Neighbor. For the author writes, my wife, Gail, and I were flying to Boston. <laughs> We were seated near the back of the airliner in two aisle seats across from each other. As the plane loaded up a woman with two small children, took the row of seats in front of us. Another woman took a seat across the aisle next to one of the kids and the mom held the other child in the lap. I hoped the kids wouldn't be noisy. My prayer wasn't answered. The two children had a tough time. The air was turbulent. The children cried a lot. Their ears hurt and it was a miserable flight. The two women kept trying to help and comfort those children. The woman at the window played with the child in the middle seat trying to make her feel good and paying her a lot of attention. Things went downhill from there. As we got toward the last part of the flight, the child in the middle seat got sick. The next thing I knew, she was losing everything from every part of the body. The diaper wasn't on tight limit before a long stitch began to rise through the cabin. It was unbearable. But I watched as the woman next to the window patiently comforted the child and tried her best to clean up the mess and make something good out of a bad situation. So the plane landed, and when we pulled up to the gate, all of us were ready to exit the plane as fast as we could. But the flight attendant came up with paper towels and handed them to the woman at the window seat and said, Here, man, these are for your little girl. The woman said, This isn't my little girl. Aren't you traveling together? No, I've never met this woman and these children before in my life. Suddenly, the author says, I realized this woman had found the opportunity to give mercy. She was, in the words of Christ, the person who was the neighbor. Yeah. So we can be thankful for the good Samaritan, yeah. but we are even more thankful for the one who looked down yeah. one day and saw we were a lost and fading yeah. people. Yeah. God sent his son, yeah. Jesus, into the world in the form of a baby yeah. who was born in Bethlehem, yeah. baptized in the Jordan River, by Satan three times yeah. and won the battle over Satan. Yeah. Turned water into wine. Yeah. Healed blinded eyes. Yeah. Healed lame legs. Yeah. Unstocked their fields. Yeah. Rose people from the dead. Yeah. But one day he saw us sinking to rise no more. Yeah. He went into the upper room with his disciples yeah. to eat the last supper. Yeah. He was betrayed and denied. Yeah. He was illegally tried. He was beaten scourged and spit on. Yeah. He hung on Calvary between two thieves from the sixth to the ninth hour. Yeah. He was working even while he was dying. Yeah. For he saved one more soul yeah. while he was hanging on the cross. Yeah. He died
he was the he was on his way to Jairus's house, but he got stopped by a funeral procession. Now he he could have said, "You gonna have to wait." I got an appointment down at Jairus's house, but he stopped the funeral procession and healed and raised that widow named son from the dead. So sometimes in our life, y'all, they're gonna come interruptions. They're gonna come inconveniences. The priest and the Levite didn't want to be inconvenient. These spiritual people, y'all, that those people look like us. God's people. So sometimes we're gonna be inconvenienced. But also remember that sometimes it's the least who will end up having to help. The most despised one of these three was the one that was the neighbor. Amen. That's how God works. God can use whoever he wants to use. However he wants to use. Why? Because he's sovereign. He's sovereign. So I, I challenge us today, Mount Pleasant, as a church, I challenge us as individuals, whenever you see the opportunity to him, don't go by on the other side. Don't tell them I'll pray for you. They need something to eat. I'll pray that you get something to eat. You are their blessing. You are their blessing. You say I'll pray for you, and then as soon as you get out of this site, you don't forget what you said. So let us. Love is an action word. People say, I love you, I love you. What good is that when you're not showing me? What if Jesus had said, I love that world? What if God had said, for the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave, he did something. He didn't say, he just didn't holler, he loved us. He gave his only begotten son. So if you love me, do something for me. That's how he wants to know. We, if you love me, then he said, then he tells his disciples, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So I wonder today, do we really love him? Do we really love him? It's time for us to stop looking down on people without doing anything to help them. Because you never know. You may be down. You may be down. And I, I, I just, on our job, whenever somebody's out of work, a box goes around with a person's name on it. And I watch people put little or nothing in the box. And sometimes I don't know who the people are. But I tell whoever's taking up the box, the next time my name might be on the box. So the Bible says, cast thy bread upon the water, and in many days it will return unto you. If you don't help somebody when you can help them, nobody's going to help you when your time comes. That's not evil. But if you want somebody to help you, you got to lend a helping hand. Let us not look down on man as we stand, as we get ready to extend an invitation. I want this, I want this church, I want us as a people to be people that help. I realized, I said earlier in my sermon that they're, they're shysters and they're schemers out there. They are. But that's where God, the Holy Spirit, will lead you and guide you to know who's the shyster and who's the schemer. He will lead and guide you. And sometimes we may be entertaining angels unawares. So that's why we need to live close enough to God so we'll know is this legitimate and, and all of us in here have been gotten at some point in our life you've helped somebody and they was they cried pull my mouth they cried they was down in the dumps and they had more than you did but don't allow that to stop you from helping others And who's to say is our Holy Spirit has come to me now that this Samaritan could have seen 
that priest and that Levite walked by on the other side. And he could have just done the same thing. He said, well, them two don't, they, 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 they God's people. They don't want to hear from why should I hear them? But thank God for the Spirit who didn't have the attitude of the others. Is there one today? We're not coming looking down on you. We, we, we're not coming to offer you anything. We're coming to offer you Christ. That's all we as a people have. We can't save you. We can't make you. All we can do is just offer it to you. It's your choice. He stands waiting and ready to forgive you of your sins, to save your soul, so that you can spend eternity with him. Is there one? In the house, is there one watching us who desires to give his or her life to Christ? Is there one who desires rededication or recommitment? You may come as well. Let us, as we get ready to go down into prayer, this is something that all of us stand in the need of. Let us pray for Mr. Wayne Russell. He runs a funeral home there in Charlotte. A funeral home my brother works for. He he said, he's not doing well, but there is a doctor above all doctors. So let us pray for Mr. Wayne Russell uh, this week. Whatever you think, let us lift Mr. Wayne Russell's name up. For we as a people, we have we have the weapon, we have a, we have a, a tool that is able to make things change, and that's called prayer. And it's time for God's people to use it more. Let us pray. God and Father, we thank you for this day and how you've blessed us and kept us. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for telling us don't look down on a man unless we're picking him up. We thank you, Father, for the Levite, for the, for the priests, not so much because they went around, but because, Father, this shows us that we as a people, we have much work to do. Help us to realize, Father, that time comes sometimes when we must put aside our job titles and our work and, and, and handle things that's present and prevalent right in front of us. So we thank you, Father, for the Samaritan who thought it not robbery to help this man who wasn't looking for anything. He was just looking to make a difference. And we thank you for him. And Father, we thank you for all of the Samaritans in, in the world today, Father, who help and just go on about their business, not wanting to get recognition, not wanting to get glory, not wanting to get honor. But Father, they do it because they have compassion and concern for their fellow man. And Father, help us as your people. For many times, Father, we have discovered even in your word, Father, <clears throat> that there are those who don't know you, who believe more in your power than your own people do. So Father, help us today to be about our Father's business, that we will give care and concern and compassion, Father, when we can. And if we can't help, Father, then we will go find some help for those who are less fortunate. We pray today, Father, for Brother Rain Wayne Russell, we pray that you will strengthen and touch and heal this body as only you can. Touch him, Lord, in the mighty and marvelous name of Jesus. Remember his family, Father. Remember the doctors and the nurses who are going to come in and out of his room. That they would display the compassion, the care, and concern, and the professionalism necessary in a time like this. We pray for sick everywhere, Father. Those who are of this body and those who are of other bodies, Father, for we know that you are here. And we've seen you do it before, and we believe you can do it again. Lord, those who are bereaved, we pray for your strength, your peace, your comfort, and your help in a time like this. For not only do they need you right now, but they're going to need you in the days, the weeks, the months, and the years to come. Bless, Lord, as only you can. And then our nation, Father, our nation needs you. There's so much going on, Father, and we, we don't know where to start. But you know. 
And we pray that you will fix it as only you can. In your own way, in your own time. And then, Father, we pray today. There are many churches in the area that are without pastors. We pray, Father, for your guidance. We pray for your direction. We pray for your patience while they are waiting on you to send them a shepherd. And we pray, Father, that while there is no shepherd, that your word will still go forth. We pray that ministry will still continue to happen. We pray that souls will continue to be saved. That people will continue to be delivered. For Father, all of us have a role in ministry. Father, we pray that these churches will listen to sound and wise counsel while they are waiting on their shepherd. Now, Lord, we pray for those who are in school, those here at Mount Pleasant and those abroad. We pray for your protection of them, Father, each and every day they go in and out of the classroom. We pray, Father, that you will be with them in their studies, that they will do their best and be the best. That they can be those who have graduated from college, Father. We pray that you will help them to find jobs. Those who have graduated from high school and didn't go to college, help them, Father, to find jobs. Help them to get planted in a career, Father. That they can make a positive difference and a positive impact in our society. Lord, that they may not, not, not only make you proud, not only make their parents proud and their family proud, but make my pleasant proud. Now, Lord, we pray for this house. We thank you, Father, how you have blessed this house. Thank you, Father, how you are moving in this house. Father, continue to move as only you can. But, Father, we want to be a light in a dark world. We want to be like the Good Samaritan Father, where we are there to help those who are down. And we realize, Father, that many times people are not down materially, Father. People are down, Father, because of circumstances in their life. People are down, Father, and they just need a kind word. They just need a smile. They just need a, you're going to make it. They just need a, God loves you in their life. Help us at Mount Pleasant to be that type of church. Help us, Father, to be a church where people can come in and heal. People can come in and be set free. People can come in and be delivered. But most of all, people can come in and be saved. Help us, Father, as pastor and people guide us in direction to give you glory and honor and praise and not ourselves. Father, we come to lift you. And when we lift you, Father, you're going to draw all men unto us. Bless us, Father, as individuals and bless us collectively. Bless those, Father, who come time and time again. Bless those, Father, who could come. Father, I don't know why they don't, but Father, bless them. In the mighty name of Jesus, dear Lord, we pray that you will continue to add to this body as you deem necessary. But Lord, if you must take away, do that because many times you take away to make us grow. Do it, Lord, as only you can. Dear Father, we pray that the day will come sooner rather than later <laughs> that we, that COVID is gone. That, Father, the protocols that are in place, Father, we won't have to have the protocols anymore. <laughs> but thank you, Father, that you made it possible for us to come back into your house and worship you. Yes. And for that, Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we thank you that we are able to worship first you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Lord, I thank you. For who you are and what you have been to me. I thank you, Father, for placing me here. I thank you, Father, for realizing that these are not my people. These are your people. 
Father, I thank you for the honor and the privilege of leading your people. And I pray that you will give me the wisdom and knowledge necessary to lead your people. Give me strength. Give me courage. Give me boldness in a time like this. For Father, we are living in some tough times. And your pastors have to make some tough decisions and say some tough things. But Lord, we know that if we say it, we know that you're going to be there with us. You're going to be there for us. Now Lord, we pray and we thank you as we get ready to close this prayer. There's one more thing we want to thank you for. And we want to thank you for the offering that you have allowed us to give to you. For Father, all of it belongs to you. We know that you only ask for 10%, but all of it belongs to you. And we thank you, Father, for the 10, and we thank you for the 9. Bless it all. That it be used for the building of your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for taking care of us in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you, Father. When we got down, on tough times when we didn't know how we were going to make it Father you stepped in and you made a way when our backs were against the wall you made a way now Lord as we depart from this place we pray that your presence will not depart from us for Father we have come in to worship now we're going out to serve we have come in and we're going to go out not looking down on a man Unless we are picking that man up. It's in the marvelous and majestic and miraculous, magnificent name of Jesus the Christ. We pray and we count it done and let every heart say amen. 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 And amen. Be blessed. Have a good week. Be blessed. Be safe. Remember our Bible study on Wednesday night, 645 via conference call. Let us continue in the first Corinthians chapter 10. Beginning at verse 14. Let us see you on Wednesday. Be safe. Have a good week and have a good rest of the day.